Good afternoon. This is the House Judiciary Non-Civil Committee. We're here to consider several bills on the agenda. Just a couple of notes uh, before we start. House Bill 32 uh, is not ready. There, I know that uh, the authors and the subcommittee were working on a potential substitute for the full committee to consider, but that's not ready yet. We may have a special call meeting on that tomorrow, depending on the timing of when that substitute is ready and then the, the ability of the full committee to go ahead and, and take a look at it prior to consideration. So be aware of that. I know that we're waiting on substitutes on or for substitutes to print. We have them, but they're not printed on 249 and 258. as well as House Bill 90. We have a quorum. Chair will call. House Bill 396, Vice Chair Reeves. Okay, okay, we'll hold on that until right after um, House Bill 341. Mr. Workheiser, are you ready on 261? Oh, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Let me, I know, uh, I apologize. Let me um, call House Bill 65 first. If you don't mind, I don't think it'll take very long, and then we'll get to you, uh, Mr. Workheiser. And this is the uh, low THC oil bill that Representative Peak presented last week. The substitute that you have in front of you is LC297493S. There are not substantial changes uh, for what Representative Peak uh, presented to us and the substitute that he gave to the committee or he presented to the committee last week. The only changes, and I'll run through where they are, on in section two, on line 35, cancer, the word, and, I'm sorry, line 36, under cancer, originally it had when uh, we struck diagnosis and end stage on, uh, or the treatment, that was in representative peak substitute. It read disease produces related wasting illness, recalcitrant nausea, and vomiting. I propose, uh, the committee substitute proposes to strike the word and and substitute the word or, so it's not a, a, a comprehensive necessity. The, uh, uh, the card can be issued to an individual who is su uh, suffering from cancer at any stage where they have wasting illness or recalcitrant nausea or vomiting. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder was struck not because of any real negativity about the condition. The condition is real. It's just the fact that we didn't have a definition to it. I've told uh, Mr. Peak on the, on the floor today that if someone can come with a definition that uh, tightens that up, we'll certainly consider it, whether in the context of an amendment or on the other side. But for right now, it, it's, it's just an overly broad term right now, but again, if it can be uh, more narrowly defined, I think it could and should deserve um, full consideration. Intractable pain as well was taken out, but that was also in taken, that was taken out actually in the version that Mr. Peake presented to us last week, so that what, that was not a committee substitute move, that was in the version that was originally given to us. Other than that, everything else has been preserved from what I'll call the peak substitute of last week. Is that your understanding, Mr. Peak? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yeah. Any questions for the chair or for Mr. Peak on the substitute you have in front of you, LC 297493S, as in Sam? Mr. Grabley. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Trammell. Hello. Oh, you're, you're, you're hiding. Mrs. Cooper. Has 
the people are wearing the ICU I think the conversation we had was that the Senate had passed a version that um, made it if you were under 18, it was limited to severe autism, and uh, and that I would not be opposed to, to some type of limitation like that or some type of definition like that um, if it was proposed in committee or if it was in a conference committee in the Senate, that was an important issue to the Senate. Um, my preference would still be to, I mean, at the end of the day, doctors are still going to be um, certifying an individual has this condition with the patient, and so uh, I would prefer to leave the definition as it is. Uh, but I think that was the extent of the conversation, was that I, I wouldn't be opposed to the Senate version of the definition of autism if it came to that. So. My preference would not be not to do that, Madam Chair, but um, I, I, I serve the will of the committee. And, 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 I, and I understand that. I've listened to several folks who um, had those same concerns. Um, I also have listened to a lot of families, including ones that are right behind me, who have autistic children who, who maybe wouldn't meet the definition of severe autism but have seen remarkable, significant, and cognitive uh, bi uh, uh, ability through the use of medical cannabis. And so for that reason, that's why we're – pushing hard to include it uh, on the condition um, and also to leave the definition as it is as well. I'll, I'll sure give it some consideration if we get to the point where that's an issue to be discussed. Uh, one thing I did, I neglected to mention earlier, there was another change. Uh, in the peak substitute, there had been, uh, the peak substitute proposed to strike the quarterly yeah. reporting requirement in subsection E uh, starting on line 78 and shift that over to the patient, I think. Um, that's correct. What, yeah. what it was in the, pa in the, uh, the peak substitute. I think what what, I, what the committee would propose out of an abundance of caution is to keep the reporting requirement, but understanding that quarterly can be can be burdensome is to shift that to um, an annual report as opposed to quarterly. So Th seek some com seek a correct. compromise on that issue. That's correct. It's on line seventy eight. Yes, sir. Yep. That's correct. Okay, but, but council tells me that is in fact it. Yes. Okay. Any further questions for the author or for the chair? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the committee? Mr. Gravely moves due pass of. House Bill 65 LC 29 7493S. Second. Second by Mr. Trammell. Are there any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion seen by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The, the motion. I'm sorry. Was it one or two? Okay. Let me go ahead and take. We'll go ahead and take the vote again. Um, all in favor of the underlying motion of do pass by substitute LC twenty nine seven four one seven S. All in. I'm sorry, House Bill sixty five LC twenty nine seven four nine three S. All in favor of the motion of do pass by substitute signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. No. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Peak. Members of the committee. Mr. Workheiser. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I bring uh, substitute 
House Bill 261, and I believe the current version is LC 297495S. Hold and on one second, Mr. Workheiser. That's what I was about to say. It's the exact same language, even though there are two number, two different numbers floating around. It's the same as 297481S. Seven four eight one S is correct. Yes, it was absolutely no changes. So two nine seven four nine five is the official. Seven four nine five S is yeah. the official substitute, but for purposes of we're going to work off. Yes. Seven four eight one S just for markup. Yes. But when we go ahead and take, if and when we take a motion, we'll take a motion under the formal copy. Okay. Yep. And that okay. was my error. Fire away. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Chairman. Yep. Um, and in deference to everybody's time, I'm going to be as brief as possible and let uh, others, if they've got something to speak. What we originally tried to do under the First, of, first um, Offender Act that this body has addressed several times, um, we were merely just changing a date so that this would be open to all individuals since the beginning of the First Offender Act. Um, what we found out through testimony from both sides, uh, through the defenders and the prosecutor, prosecutors is, this does not expand, it merely clarifies and code what was the intention all along. So, um, because during this process, uh, we had uh, Chuck Spayhaus along with the Justice project, project and all parties involved at the table. And so they helped with the language and this is the uh, ending result. And so again, it does not expand it. It merely corrects and code what was the intention all along through the Criminal Justice Reform Act. Okay, the, um, and I, I see with the consent of the prosecuting attorney petition the Superior Court so it's not a guarantee. Correct. On the, and I have a feeling you know, let me go ahead and call on, um, before I ask the question, I will ask the question, then I'm going to call on the okay. subcommittee chair, and he can go ahead and answer as well. I'm calling the vice chair, uh, with, uh, subcommittee chair on House Bill 261. The question I've got is the, the use of the word exoneration on line 22. It's on an actual exonerate. is it an actual exoneration? In other words, I know the record can be shown I know law enforcement has the ability to access the record, correct? But is, does it an actual, is it an actual exoneration of guilt? Yeah, yeah. It, it acts as a matter of law that the person who wants the first offender sentence is served successfully, then there is no imposition of guilt. And that's consistent with the use of the First Offender Act for whatever else it's, it's used for? Report of the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Reeves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, this um, this bill received favorable consideration. It was unanimous. Um, the discussion, we, we discussed all the changes and um, had testimony from various groups, including the prosecutor's attor prosecuting attorney's counsel. The, um, I think the key to the matter is in line 20 and 21 that the, um, the consent of the prosecuting attorney is still a requirement in this which is uh, consistent with with the law that takes place after the state in 1982 and um, so this was um, favorably received and I think it's a good policy questions for the author or for mr. Reeves from members of the committee seeing none what's the pleasure of the committee Move to pass. Second. mr. Reeves moves due pass of HB 261 LC 29 7495S. 7495S. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Gravely. Are there any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the motion's adopted. Thank you, Mr. Workheiser. Thank you very much.
We'll call House Bill 90, Mr. Gasway. And let's also confirm the substitute, the version that we're working from on House Bill 90. That is the one? It's LC 297439S, correct? That's correct. Okay, you also have in your file LC 297417S. Please discard that substitute. Please discard 7417S. Dis discard 7417. That's not the appropriate substitute. The appropriate substitute is 7439S. Mr. Gasway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, as we've said, I'm bringing a substitute to House Bill 90, 7439S. This is a continuation of some existing code to try to clarify and strengthen the, the uh, penalties for self-dealing by a certain group of elected officials in property acquisition. We'll get a report uh, from the subcommittee chair, Mr. Reeves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill, um, I think what, we have three subcommittee hearings on this, or four. Four. We, we really worked hard, Representative Gasway really worked hard on, um, as we say in this committee a lot, threading the needle. And um, there was a lot of, there were several aspects of this that, that we went round and round on to get comfortable. And um, I believe that we reached the place where we, we have a good piece of legislation that um, I think achieves uh, Representative Gazaway's goal. We really, truly spent a tremendous amount of time um, in the words on this. And um, I think that for the most part, we, uh, I did, it passed unanimously out of subcommittee, is that right? That's my recollection. It did, okay. So um, I think that this does meet um, a need that Representative Gasway has absolutely demonstrated through various um, examples across the state. And so um, I, um, this did receive very favorable consideration or um, like I said, it was unanimously voted out once we finally got to the, the final posture of this bill. And we, um, we did take testimony. We heard from various groups. I believe um, GMA, who is, is GMA present today in the room? Yes. And um, I know GMA had worked very closely with Representative Gasway, and it's my understanding that they were satisfied with the, um, with the, where the resolution that we reached. Thank you. Questions for the author, for members of the committee? Seeing none, are there any parties here in opposition to House Bill 90? Any parties present who would like to be heard in opposition to House Bill 90? Speak now or forever. <laughs> Ms. Ballinger. Oh, um, anyone would like to be heard in opposition to House Bill 90? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the committee, Ms. Ballinger? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to pass on House Bill 90, LC 297439S. Ms. Ballinger moves do pass of House Bill 90, LC 297439S, second by Ms. Silcox. Are there any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentlelady's motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gasway. Mr. Reeves, House Bill 341. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If the, um, I don't think that, they, they may not be necessary, but Mr. McLaughlin, Mr. Boring, and Ms. Racine, if y'all want to come up and sit down in case the committee, these are the subject matter experts in case the committee has any questions, but what, 
I want to do is just walk the committee through uh, the, the bill and the amendment. Yes, we're on uh, the substitute is LC 297447S. And the amendment, which is right behind it in your folder, is AM292590. And uh, we're going to be probably spending more time walking through the amendment than the bill. So please kind of have these side by side. But uh, we had an extensive. Hold on one second. Members, I want to make sure everybody has the amendment. AM292590. 292590 is the amendment that Mr. Reeves is working on, working off of. Mr. Bode, you have it? Yes, I have it. I don't have the original. The substitute? Yes, the, the underlying substitute? He's got it. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Reeves. Yeah. Okay. I have worked in conjunction with the Attorney General's office on this issue. Um, just, uh, we had a very a long and productive subcommittee hearing on this, and what I want to do is be as brief as possible right now, and then if there's any discussion, get into details. But the General Assembly has been addressing the issue of human trafficking in Georgia for. Um, approximately 15 years in 2006 the human trafficking statute as it largely appears now was um, passed by this body and there have been various updates through the years to get it to where it is right now in 2013 there was a joint study committee with the House and Senate on the issue and one of the top recommendations for the long-term uh, plan of what Georgia needed to do to address the issue of human trafficking dealt with with having stronger laws as it relates to the demand of human trafficking. And the demand are also known as the customers and also known as, um, I guess the, the, the slang word is the Johns for that participate are the customers for the, the demand aspect in human trafficking. This is simple economics, the supply and a demand. And there's it's um, been very well researched and uh, stated that as long as there is a demand, there's going to be a supply. And so right now, Georgia's laws are, are um, the human trafficking statute is lacking in addressing the demand of this issue. This is really um, a national trend. A lot of states have gone in this direction. And what we have also done, it's very important to understand, is queue up with what federal law is. Right now, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Georgia has, uh, the Congress has passed this into federal law. And what we are doing is syncing up our human trafficking statute with uh, literally the model of the same words that, that the federal statute uses in other states. And so um, if you will look at the bill, Section 1, which is really where um, our amendment mostly comes out of Section 1, at the, 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 in the substitute you see the words under, underlined patronize and solicits. Those are the two words that um, federal law uses as well as other states in order to try to capture the demand so that uh, prosecutor's offices and the attorney general's office has the ability to um, prosecute the demand aspect of the human trafficking puzzle or picture. Um, when we were at the subcommittee, we were looking at the word, the word person appears several times in, in subparagraph C, and we, um, a change was, an amendment was made to change that from, uh, it was suggested that it be, uh, be changed to individual, subcommittee amended it to change it back to person, and if you look at the amendment, the very first section, you will see the word person struck out several times and individual added back in. That is because um, at the subcommittee hearing, we misinterpreted or didn't, th th this context of the word person and what should be individuals in the context of the victim and not the the um, the, the the actual um, defendant or the the perpetrator of of human trafficking crimes and so if you look at lines five through ten the um, insertion of the word individual is to actually place it back to where um, legislative council had originally suggested that we change that to make it consistent with other law you also see in section c that we have, instead of it being one continuous paragraph, it's been divided out into one, two, and three. So that's lines seven through 11. 
And so it just it's, it's, stated, it's taking the same words in C, but dividing it out into three sections. And the reason why is for a sentencing a carve out that occurs later. And I think it also makes it easier to read. But um, so continuing on with the amendment, if we if we look into line, starting at line 12, which is section F in the human trafficking statute, this um, there are multiple ways that you can traffic. Um, two of the main ways is through labor servitude. And one of the other ways is through sexual servitude. We are not touching or dealing with the concept of labor servitude in this bill. We are strictly dealing with sexual servitude. And so what we have done in this amendment in order to make the statute read better is F1 and F2 are now limited to labor servitude. So when you see the language struck in lines 16 through 22, that's all language that deals with sexual servitude. So that language is struck. So paragraph one and two is now strictly labor servitude. If you move down to lines 26, which is gonna be section three, and then on the next page, section four, which is line 33, these two code sections, so F3 and F4 now relate to sexual servitude. So what um, the changes in this bill, and these are the most important changes um, to discuss today, again, Going back to line 11, we're adding in patronizes or solicits. So that is closing the gap, completing the human trafficking puzzle in Georgia, allowing our prosecutors and our attorney general's office in cases where appropriate to be able to pursue the demand aspect of this horrible reality. So going back down to F3, F3 says that if you, um, if you violate the uh, sexual servitude provisions, then your punishment will be 10 to 20 years, which is current law. And, um, and so that would also include the new offenses of patronizing and solicits. But then if you look halfway through line 29, this was based on, um, this is a change I made, um, thought long and hard about this after the discussion that we had um, at subcommittee. And um, in order to make this language consistent with the felony pandering statute, which right now, if, if, if you commit the offense of felony pandering with a 16 or 17 year old um, victim, then the sentencing range is five to 20. So in order to have not have inconsistent um, policies, We've carved out, if you violate human trafficking and the offense is, is that you have, you have paid for relations with somebody or you've paid for sex with somebody who is 16 or 17 years old, but there are no other um, elements that sometimes can be found in trafficking, such as coercion and deception, then the sentencing range should be 5 to 20 in that particular scenario. And again, this was uh, uh, the discussion at subcommittee, and I believe... Um, I believe I've taken a step here that hopefully um, makes this consistent, creates a consistent policy, and that the committee um, will look favorably upon. And then subsection four, or number four, F4, which starts on line 33, this is, um, this is, again, we are, we're defining a punishment level or a, cr a, cr a criminal act of sexual servitude. This section deals with when you are dealing, when, when the victim is under the age of 18 and there is also an element of coercion or deception. We had a lot of testimony at subcommittee about coercion and deception. And these are some of just the absolutely unthinkable, hideous, horrible fact patterns um, that some of the prosecutors that are here today have dealt with. So this... Um, so again, what this does is it just divides out. So if you'll follow me, F1 and F2 are labor servitude. We're not changing anything in the law with that. F3 and 4 is just drawing out the different punishment levels for sexual servitude. The, the, um, the difference here is that number 4 includes essentially two elements. The victim has to be under the age of 18 and there has to be facts of knowledge and awareness of coercion or deception in order for number four to be met. So those are the main changes to section one. The rest of the bill 
is unchanged essentially from where we were in subcommittee. Um, for for the sake of time, what I would like to do now is is talk about um, is to see if anybody has any questions or discussion. So just to be clear, the violation, just what I'll call a uh, a violation that doesn't go doesn't have the special criteria in subsection four, including the patronizing <laughs> or soliciting. That ends up being 10 to 20 for someone who's 16 or 17 years old. And then the added factor in four, then when you have that under 18, but you add the factor of coercion, deception of someone who has a developmental disability, and those are all inclusive. You have to have the coercion deception is related to the individual who has a developmental disability, then that ups it to 25 to 50 is that right yes if it's that it's that meeting that second element so if the offense is and folks at the table correct me if I'm mistaken here in number three if the victim is under 18 or if the victim is developmentally delayed then you fall under number three if the victim is under 18 or developmentally delayed and there is also in addition the element of coercion or deception then you would fall under number four is that correct well i don't see the element of developmental delay in number three am i missing that it's it's a violation of subsection c and um c sexual servitude if you go to the definition of sexual servitude um, sexual servitude is defined as in five ways a coercion or deception b from an individual who is under the age of 18 c from an individual who the accused believes is under 18 d from an individual who has a developmental disability or e from an individual who the accused believes to have a developmental disability and those are all ors right it's that's right those are all ors okay and so any of those alone land you in number three it's a combination of age and developmental disability plus coercion or deception that land you in number four okay. am i correct there i'm looking at the old statute i believe let, let uh let us know who you are oh sorry that would help uh chuck boring with the cobb county district attorney's office thank you for your time um looking at actually the let us know who who else is at the sorry, table uh, as well this is a <laughs> david mclaughlin with the attorney general's office and dahlia racine to cab county district attorney's okay, office. okay great thank you welcome all of you thank you for having us um, looking at it initially, the way the statute as it stands now today, uh, developmentally delayed, that actually is something that I believe uh, if that is a prong that's met, it already is the 25 to 50 years, if that is a, the actual uh, act that's proven right now. I don't believe this is changing that at all. I don't believe that comes in under the 10 to 20 at this time. I think it already exists as a 25 to 50 year uh, sentence period if you have a person who's sub uh, subjected to sexual servitude and that person is developmentally delayed. Uh, it has no uh, relation to age or anything like that. That's an automatic, I guess, step up was what was passed in the past that uh, has it at a 25 to 50 uh, sentencing range, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, this, so it strikes me as this is maybe a little bit of belt and suspenders, but it, but that's fine. Yeah, I, and I think <laughs> a lot of it is just... Uh, it, we do that a lot, just to make sure. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I, I think that part of that is they're trying to parse out the sentencing ranges to make it clear that... Um, you're carving out this exception because of the discussion at the subcommittee. When you've got the, I hate to say, the, the, uh, the base level of human trafficking, um, whereas in the past uh, it, the base level was 10 to 20, it's like that based on this statute, but since we've added patronize and solicit, um, if it's a 16 or 17-year-old victim of this, to go in to, to basically have it relate to pandering and be, it, for lack of a better term, equal on par with sentencing, that small narrow window would be five to 20 now. Uh, and I think based on the, uh, the discussion we had at subcommittee, there were some concerns from some of the members about uh, there being some difference in the sentencing level. And so this is a very narrow carving out of that one situation uh, where it's a baseline human trafficking offense. The child is under 18 years of age, but over 15 years of age. So with, with pandering, that sentence reflects what we have here. Okay. Is, um and I just don't recall if this was, I was involved with Representative Lindsay's House Bill 200 a few years ago when we started 
really getting aggressive on the human trafficking uh, issue. Is human trafficking, is that a, uh, currently, is that a predicate act for invoking uh, the usage of the RICO statute? Uh, it is. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions for the author or for the panel? Mr. Sessler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the author's um, attentiveness to the detail. Again, as, as he alluded to, the question of having consistency in sentencing for these, the, the 5 to 20 came up, and he addressed that in, this, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the amendment. Um, I would say, just parenthetically for everybody, um, one of the things that was discussed in subcommittee that I think it's the author's goal to maybe be silent on, and that's, that, that's certainly his prerogative, is the broader question of um, civil remedies. So whether it's against the person pandering or, or, or having a, or maintaining a place of prostitution, um, the ability to use, um, for example, somebody that was in sexual servitude that, that's sort of been drug into that lifestyle and through that lifestyle that's in a, some step of recovery, um, very often, because they've been victimized, they've not been participants, they've not been guilty of prostitution, they've been, but they've been trafficked. The, the ability for them to um, tell their story, in many cases they remember details, all too many details, and can bring civil actions against places of prostitution or pimps or otherwise. Um, I would just say before the committee, I think it's a, an objective this committee ought to entertain moving forward that um, in terms of bringing real heat to these people, um, civil rights of action, I think, may, I would suggest, perhaps over time, do as much for that as this could. I, but we didn't want to, it's such a complicated swamp of things to work through. Um, out of an abundance of caution, the author didn't want to go there. But I, I do think it's something we ought to consider moving forward. Yeah, it's a two-year term, right? That's right. And yeah, I had many term, discussions. We can definitely look at. We should. I had many discussions with various people, and um, there is, um, th I believe there is something can be done. It's very different than what we have here, but there is some premises liability with the apportionment statute that probably serves as an interference to those kinds of cases moving forward now, and that's something that, that I want to look at, I think we need to look at. Yeah, that's a perfect issue for the off season, honestly. And I think, and I think you really do better by the issue to go ahead and separate them out one at a time. Um, just out of an abundance of caution around here, when we have the time to do something, we do better to use it. Uh, during the session is hard enough, and it, when you have not necessarily fighting a two-fronted battle, but when you've got, but, but a civil cause of action presents a whole array of issues, all of which I think are ultimately worth it. I really do, but I just think you need to go ahead and sit down on the off-season and really hammer it out in order to make sure we get it right. But I'm, I'm enthusiastic. And, and I would credit Representative Silcox for really bringing that to the subcommittee. That's really something mm -hmm. she identified that I think we, we're advised to heed. Well, I'm glad she did. Mm -hmm. See, uh, Mr. Boring from Cobb County, and we got the child, uh, Ms. Silcox got the child hearsay statute on, <laughs> you know, all taken care of today, and we'll go over to the other side, and this will be a, that's a perfect segue for, you know, how Ms. Silcox mm -hmm. may spend the next six months <laughs> 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 legislatively. I don't know. I'm not, not persuading, dissuading, just simply thinking out loud on that. I'd be happy for her to handle that. So. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> no we'll, doubt. We'll be happy to meet with her on that. Ms. Price. I just had a couple of comments, Mr. Chairman, uh, regarding, I guess, the consistency of letters or words. Um, what microphone number are you right there? I'm sorry, 17. Okay. Uh, just to have consistency between numbers and words. In some cases, the, the numbers are spelled out. In some cases, they're just the number itself. And I don't know what's standard in... What specifically are you looking at? Uh, I'm looking at line 15 on, this, on the amendment. 10 is spelled out. Uh, also, and then 20 is the numeric. Correct. I would defer to um, legislative council. <laughs> My guess is this is probably not the, the, if we went through the code section, probably would find a good bit of this. But Ms. Travis, do you? Uh -huh. If it's an intent or less, you spell it. If it's a percentage, you have numbers. The number on, numbers on line 15 is what okay. is written. Mm -hmm. and then every one that I've noted was in that category, so thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Any further questions for the author? Seeing none, is there anyone who'd like to be heard up in a opposition, in opposition to House Bill 341? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the committee? Mr. Sessler moves do pass. By committee substitute. Of committee sub of House Bill 341 by substitute, LC 29-7447-S. Second. Second by Mr. Gravely. Are there any amendments, Mr. Reeves? Yes, I offer as an amendment AM 292590. Mr. Reeves offers AM 292590, the amendment he's been speaking from speaking to. Uh, any discussion on the amendment? Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of Mr. Reeves' amendment 292590 signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the amendment is adopted. Are there any, are there any further amendments? Seeing none, on the underlying motion of do pass by substitute of House Bill 341, all in favor of the underlying motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The motion's adopted. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Thank you. We'll move directly to House Bill 396. Yes. Um, if everybody can, oh, oh my gosh, everybody can take a look at Alan Powell's bill. Um, I'm sorry, at House Bill 396. Why, why we, uh, let's do We'll take one minute to uh, clean up an inadvertent carbonated drink um, emergency over here. Anybody we'll doesn't we'll have any napkins we'll on We'll suspend it for just a minute. Continue consideration on House Bill 396. House Bill 396 in your folder is LC297342. This is a very small piece of the bill that we just passed that um, I filed in, in a separate freestanding form um, just to be safe. This bill cures an issue that was caused with the, a bill that we passed a few years ago that deals with consecutive sentencing on sex crimes uh, several years ago. A few years ago, a bill was passed that created, um, the concept was once a person serves their sentence, they have to receive at least one year of probation. And um, so that once they're released, the Department of Corrections or probation can track where they move to and where they live. Uh, the way that that was worded and the way it's been interpreted um, in courts is that it has essentially created a gap year. There are certain um, fact patterns that warrant consecutive sentencing where, let's say, after a, a trial, a person convicted of multiple counts of child molestation would receive consecutive sentences. So let's just say that he received two consecutive sentences of 40 years. The way the law is written right now is that on year 19, the offender has to be released to go on probation for a year, and then... Uh, check back into prison a year later and continue his sentence. This is a problem. Um, it has been a serious problem in sentencing courts. 
Um, that problem solved with the bill that we just passed, but as I mentioned, uh, I wanted to have it in a freestanding version uh, just to be safe, and so that's what this bill is. It's the exact replica or identical version of one of the sections in the bill that we just passed. Questions for the author? Seeing that this is a technical correction, ultimately, correct? That's right. Okay. Such that when you have consecutive sentences, you don't have to have a. It, it can't possibly have ever been the legislative intent that you know you have to probate a sentence for at least a year prior to the, to the consecutive sentence being imposed. That is correct. Okay. What's the pleasure of the committee? Moved to pass. Moved to pass by Mr. Trammell of House Bill 396 LC 297342S. Second. Second by Ms. Silcox. Are there any amendments? Seeing none. Any further discussion? All in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Chairman Tanner, are you ready? Okay. We'll call um, House Bill 249. Do we all have the sub the uh, the new substitute? Yeah, while we're waiting, let me recognize let me recognize former representative Charlize Bird. Welcome. Great to have you. Great to see you. Very nice to meet you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for remembering Mr. Reeves. <laughs> That's right. And live to tell the tale. Yeah. <laughs> Chairman Tanner, that um, that substitute is being passed out right now. Chairman Tanner and um, Chairwoman Cooper, yeah, yes, welcome sir. on House Bill 249. Chairman Tanner. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've worked closely with I'm Chairman. I'm sorry. Could we get, could we lower the volume level in the room, please? If you have, to, if you have a conversation, just please take it outside. Thank you. Chairman Tanner. Thank you. I've worked very closely with Chairman Cooper and her unique set of experience in this area, so I want to let her say uh, some opening comments about the legislation you have in front of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Tanner for letting me help with this bill. As you know, I, anybody knows me that I've been very concerned about our opiate uh, problem in this country for several years, and I'm glad to see that we are moving forward with bills, and it's a real pleasure to work with Representative Tanner on this bill. But so the committee will know, I just passed out uh, an article for you about how we have to be careful as we go about restricting and trying to help our doctors not order too much, but also not to restrict them. Because studies have already found that when people are not really careful and legislatures are not really careful about how they change the rules, that will hap what will happen is doctors become very cautious and patients who really need the medicine, <coughs> they don't get it. We had a good example of this in Cobb County recently. We had someone that, uh, someone close to me knows well, his parents ate dinner with this couple every Friday in my district. They'd come all the way from Smyrna to eat at a place in my district. Uh, about a month and a half ago, the gentleman was sick. He was diagnosed with terminal cancer. It was metastatic all over his body. Uh, when they met again about three weeks after his diagnosis, he was in terrible pain, and he told them that he had been to two doctors, and neither one of them would order him anything for pain. He was in such crippling pain that they said, you need to go to the hospital. He was admitted to the hospital and never left. He died. From diagnosis to death was 40 days. Now, I, we haven't asked the widow yet, but we're going to, and I'm going to be talking to the two doctors that would not give a terminally ill patient pain medicine. That is not acceptable. But we don't want to scare our doctors about ordering the medication. 
we want to help control the flow of opiates, but we want to, wanted to do it in a very realistic way. And so that we were moving from here to here with incentives, not punishment, instead of moving here from here to over here and overreacting and making it difficult for people who need pain medicine to get it. So we have carefully crafted this bill, and I think we have hit that balance. And I, once again, I appreciate the committee hearing it. I appreciate Representative Tanner working with me, and I'm going to turn it back over to him, and I'll be glad to help him an or help answer questions if you later on. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. LC 2974491S, again, LC 2974491S is the substitute that we're working off of. Uh, and like Chairman Cooper said, Mr. Chairman, when we started this process, I started working on this about a year ago uh, with a heroin task force, opioid task force that the U.S. Attorney's Office had put together here in Atlanta. Um, my background in law enforcement, I've been involved uh, in a lot of these sit uh, tragic situations with overdoses and the abuse of our prescription medication. So one of the things that has come out of this task force has been to try to identify ways to prevent people from doctor shopping and getting opioids from multiple doctors and then abusing them. Statistically, around 80% of the people addicted to heroin started out using a prescription opioid. Uh, so we know that something has to be done. Like Chairman Cooper says, there's a tendency in government to swing the pendulum way too far. It goes from one end to the other. What we've attempted to do here is strike a balance. And I think we saw that at the subcommittee meeting when we had uh, the doctors, MAG, we had the uh, pharmacist, we had uh, the hospitals all testify in favor of this legislation. And I will tell you, that's not been the case across, um, across the other side of the Capitol in some of the hearings they've had with some of the legislation they've been attempting to move. So I think we have a good piece of legislation. Uh, since subcommittee met, and one of the reasons for this uh, substitute in front of you is uh, it's been brought to my attention by the governor's office and by Rick Allen with Georgia Department of Drugs and Narcotics that it's their desire to move the administration of this uh, database uh, from his department over to the Department of Public Health. Um, that's a decision based on resources and the ability to uh, better operate the system, I believe. Uh, Director Allen has indicated several times that he does not have the adequate staff. So I think the governor's office feels that, and the departments feel that this would be better suited. So that, that's done in the draft that you see in front of you, the substitute. Um, going on down through, uh, Mr. Chairman, we, in this legislation, uh, we, we've done a couple of things. First, every doctor who has a DEA uh, registration number will have to enroll in the PDMP uh, by January 1st of 2018. Uh, this, this allows them to sign up, get a username and password so they can access the system. Under current law, uh, the system's there for them to use, but only about 25% or so of the doctors are, are registered to use the system. And out of that, there's about half that, of those that use the system on a regular basis. So this would require that everyone that has a DEA registration number uh, sign up. Now, I will tell you the reason we put DEA registration number. If you're a pathologist, you're working in a medical examiner's office, of course, you have no need to uh, prescribe drugs. You don't have that DEA registration number. And then by between January 1st and May 31st of next year, the department will certify that is accessible and operating at 99.5% of the time. Uh, the intent there is there's a concern that when we have all these new doctors and delegates signing up to use the system that it could overload the system. We know it's going to have to be upgraded. So we want to make sure before we require docs to go and check the system that it's operating uh, correctly. So that's the purpose of that. And again, this has been uh, carefully worked on and negotiated uh, throughout the process uh, with the doctor community. Uh, and then the other changes are just changing agency to the department. Again, that's a result of changing who's responsible for the database. Um, and then over on line 100, uh, 98 uh, through 100, uh, we're now requiring that pharmacists in this legislation uh, update the system on a daily basis every 24 hours. In the past, that was done every seven days. Uh, so that, that is a change because we're going to be requiring doctors to check the database. And again, that, that's not a change from the subcommittee, but that's just a change from current law. 
and then um, and then on down on that same page 114 through 121 and again is some additional information about what the department's able to do with that information one of the things we want to make very sure of is that the department cannot share this information this private information if that information is misused and that can be a crime under current law and it's still that way here criminal action and civil action uh, but one of the things that they want to be able to do is keep the non-identifying information so trends that type of thing longer than the two-year period so that's what you see in lines 118 through 120. Um, On over in uh, on lines 180, starting on 180, this is where we allow for delegates. Uh, one of the concerns that the doctors had was that if they're required to check uh, the database is they are busy and often don't have time and they want to make sure they're able to have delegates in their office that are able to do that. Uh, line 180 starts laying out that process. Um, I'll answer specific questions about this, Mr. Chairman, but in essence what is allowed to happen is a doctor can select two delegates. So for each prescriber, they can have two delegates in their office that work on their staff. Those individuals could be an RN or that individual could be an office manager. If they're registered or licensed with the state like an RN, then they've already been through a criminal background check, et cetera, with the state. But if they're an office manager, then they would be required to go through that process, make sure that they're not uh, the type of individual that we would not want to have access to this sensitive information. So we uh, put safeguards in to make sure only uh, the right kind of character uh, and the right kind of background individuals are accessing this type of information that's sensitive and can be a HIPAA violation. Um, it goes on down to, um, again, talking about the misuse. And then starting on lines 200, uh, this again is if the person misuses the information, they can be charged criminally and civilly, and that's uh, very clear in this legislation. One of the things that the hospitals brought up to us uh, early on in this process was is that they have doctors that are on contract with the hospital to see patients. Uh, they also have doctors who are on contract to work in the ER, and many times, because uh, originally we only had that the hospital could only have two delegates per shift. Grady, for instance, talked to us and said, you know, in our emergency room on a Friday or Saturday night, um, two delegates per shift is just not going to practically be enough. So uh, that's where we get lines 205 through 208. In essence, what happens there is the hospital uh, and the, each prescriber at the hospital can have two individuals per shift who are employed or contracted by the hospital, that also has to be approved by the medical uh, director there at the hospital. So that will allow for ample individuals to be on staff and on duty at the hospital, uh, even at a hospital like Grady, to be able to handle the load that may come through on a given night. Um, and then going on over to uh, line 305, three starting on lines 305. This is where we get into the specific language about what we're requiring the doctors to check, the prescribers to check. Again, under current law, the database is out there, but there's no requirement for the doctors to check the database. One of the things when we started this process is we wanted to identify what is the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, some drafts of legislation around the Capitol has had that you would check, they would check all medications, Schedule 2, 3, 4, and 5. But those are not, all of those are not what we're going after. We're concerned about those that are being abused, those that are causing overdoses, and those that are leading people to become addicted and ultimately be on heroin and other uh, narcotics and, and illegal drugs that we're concerned about. So uh, we've carefully worked on, again, with the doctors and other interested parties in lines 305 through 308 to specify what we're talking about. We're talking about those opioids and those other drugs that's listed there on 306, 307, and 308 uh, that everyone agrees uh, are the ones that we're concerned about. Yes, and, and just in case, if you saw me scurrying around, um, we were just checking to make sure that we didn't get the medicines for the ADDH children. Uh, because that's not what we were looking for and that's not the problem area. So we were making sure that the way this was written excluded those, those children under the schedule, and it does. 
One of the other things that we tried to do, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee, is uh, starting on lines 309, we, we wanted to identify times that the doctor would not have to check the database. One of the things we did is we said that if it's only for a three-day supply, no more than a three-day supply, not to exceed 26 pills, they would not have to check the database. Uh, the purpose of that is if you come into your general practitioner and you've hurt your shoulder or hurt your knee, uh, the doctor's probably going to set you up with a specialist. You're going to go see your orthopedic. Um, what we're trying to do is, is have an incentive for the doctor not to overprescribe that medication without telling them how to practice medicine. So you come to me and I'm your general, general practitioner and I'm going to send you to an orthopedic, then I can write you a three-day prescription of a narcotic to help you with your pain uh, but, and not have to check the database. If I go over that uh, three-day supply, then I have to check the database, and I, th I think that's important. The other, some of the other reasons they would not have to check the database is if the patient is in a hospital or health care facility, such as a nursing home, intermediate care, personal care, hospice program, or other places that provide inpatient care. If you're in the emergency room at the hospital and you've got an open compound fracture and you need a narcotic in your IV, then the doctor does not have to stop and go check before he gives you that medication. If the medication is going to be used and administered on the premises, the doctor does not have to check. Again, we're concerned about people who are doctor shopping. Now, if the doctor in the ER is going to write you a prescription to take home with you and it's over a three-day supply, then they would have to check, but not if it's administered on site. Now, the other thing that we wanted to do is try to catch outpatient surgeries at a hospital or a surgical center. If you go in and have your, your knee replaced, for instance, uh, and they're going to send you home, they can give you a 10-day supply, no more than 40 pills, without having to check. Again, trying to put in an incentive without telling a doctor how to practice medicine, maybe to encourage them not to overprescribe uh, these narcotics when it might not be necessary. So again, that you'll find that. We also wanted to cover outpatient hospice programs. Those are people who are sent home on hospice, in ho home hospice, and they're sent home to basically die and be under the care of a hospice nurse until they're able to pass in the comfort of their home. We do not want the doctors have, having to check in those cases. The other time would be as if they're receiving ongoing treatment for cancer. Again, if someone's uh, under ongoing cancer treatment, they do not have to check. Um, and the liability here for the doctor, if they fail to check in some of these instances where it's required, it would be an administrative accountability to the regulatory board. Uh, there's no criminal action that would be taken. It would be handled by the medical board, for instance, for a doctor. The, um, also, we put in the legislation that the prescriber would make a notation in the patient's file that they checked. Um, there is no requirement if they check the database and the database is down at no fault of the doctor. They make a note. That's as far as it has to go. What we don't want to have happen is a patient sitting at the doctor's office and the doctor saying, give me another hour. I'll try the system again when it's back up. So uh, they make a note and we can, uh, we can move on. And again, it just states in lines 333 through 341, making it clear that they, they do not have to check. They can check, but they do not have to check for any of the schedules and any of the drugs that's not specifically required in the bill. Um, the uh, Going on into section 1-4, lines 396 through 408, uh, the drug commonly known as Narcan, um, naloxone, as you know, the governor had issued some directives to allow that to be sold by pharmacists over the counter. This is, uh, we also are codifying that here in this legislation. So codifying the directive from the department and from the governor to make that easier to obtain. Um, and then on, uh, Section 2-1, Part 2, this is also uh, new to this substitute, Mr. Chairman. This was uh, Representative Stacy Evans has worked on this issue, and she's worked with the doctors and MAG, and they have indicated to me that they support this language. Uh, all this does is it would have the prescriber who's issuing a prescription for an opioid 
provide pati the patient receiving that prescription with information on the addictive risk of using the opioids uh, and safety information about how to dispose of it. So it would be a pamphlet that would go home with the, uh, with the patient. I think there were so many verbally. I think there was. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think it specifies it has to be in writing, so okay. it could be verbal. Uh, but they have, it just says the issues um, shall provide the patient receiving the information, information. Um, and it says verbally or in writing. And then the last section, section three, uh, this section just requires that a coroner or chief medical examiner would have to report any drug overdose deaths to the chief medical examiner at the state. This currently does not have to occur and one of the things that the GBI would like to be able to do is more accurately uh, determine and monitor the patterns of drug overdoses so they can put their available resources in the field to be able to try to stop those from occurring before they do. Um, one last thing, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be glad to answer questions. We noticed in going through this uh, substitute that P, the PDMP is, call, is uh, inappropriately called the PMDP here and all through this bill. So that's just a uh, clerical yeah, error that can be fixed, but I just wanted to draw that to your attention. It's supposed to be PDMP. We'll, we'll move that as a cleanup amendment at the appropriate time. Uh, report of the subcommittee, Chair, Mr. Sessler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we did have a lot of discussion in subcommittee around the policy here. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be candid. There was, there's some some sentiment on the subcommittee that perhaps we ought to be more stringent. Others felt not so. I think there was some back and forth debate. I will say that I think um, the consensus policy wise was that Chairman Cooper and uh, and Chairman Tanner are trying to operate with a soft hand on this and not be not, not be overly prescriptive or punitive. I will say um, there was also discussion around um, an indemnity that, in essence. Um, limits doctors from civil liability for failure to put information in this data. That was that was of note. I think that is a. Um, I mean, we, that's it's a policy question. Um, maybe that's good policy. Maybe it's not. But I, that was that was certainly debated. Um, I would say the change in in, in the shift from um, the agency to um, public health wasn't contemplated or discussed in subcommittee. So that 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 is a policy change. I think that the full committee would would you know do well to address if they have questions. That was not taken up in subcommittee, and it is, is part of the gentleman's substitute, so. And I assume you've got, uh, all parties are in consent, state narcotics and DPH, as well as the administration in general, is comfortable with the, the transition that'll occur. Is there any timing mechanism on that, or is that just a regular July 1, but they'll, as a practical matter, it'll take probably the better part of how long? Well, it goes into effect at the governor's signature, and I did talk to uh, the department, Rick Allen, the Georgia Nar Drug and Narcotics. I've also talked with the governor's office, and uh, they are all in consent that that would be the best move. Okay. Mr. Chair, I would say, um, I, I get outside of the committee report, just speaking as a member to that, I, I, I do want to ask, the, I do have some questions for the, for the chair, chairman about that change. At sure. The appropriate time. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I just, I share this and this, um, you know, the, I, I'm just going to say it for purposes of emphasis because I think it needs to be said um, again and again on uh, lines 148 through 149, page 5. Um, when this was passed back in 2011, it actually came to this committee, it, it had, the PMP effort had been brought in the 2009 session, 2010 session, failed both sessions. It was brought in 2011 and finally successfully made it to this committee on a number of um, conditions, one of which the department should be authorized to provide requests for pre prescription information collected with persons as part only as follows, the idea of locking down who had access to information. And on lines 167 through uh, 172, um, local or state law enforcement pursuant to a search warrant issued by an appropriate court official, and then on lines 169 through 172, federal prosecutorial officials pursuant to a valid warrant, not, not a, um, um, there was real concern about the access to this information by federal officials that would kind of use this, and uh, I think we would recognize the federal government is perhaps more loose 
in their understanding of privacy, perhaps in this General Assembly, would be. I just wanted to make sure that nothing in transferring the database from um, Georgia Drugs and Narcotics to public health would in any way undermine the protections that were very rigorously and intentionally put here. Um, pursuant to some other law that happens, it, it, the Department of Public Health may have the ability to transfer data that they manage through other authority not contemplated in these code sections to federal agencies um, that would undermine 167 through 172, because I will tell you that was a hard fought and a very important condition of this PDMP being established in 2011. So the concern is that just under the category of the law of unintended consequences that in the transition from state narcotics to DPH that there may be either an unintended security breach or does by virtue of it heading over to DPH create a crack in that armor for uh, pursuant to the security of that information? Is that the question? Yes, Mr. Chairman. If DPH has the, the, the broader authority to share information for databases they that they manage to share much more permissively um, by virtue of it being their responsibility and their, and their part of Title 31, if that can be, be shared in a much more fungible back and forth way by virtue of it being in their title, as opposed to what was clearly locked down here in Title 16. That's, that's a concern I can't answer by looking at the sub. Can you all speak to that, or can narcotics and or, and or DPH speak to that if they, if they can? Well, nothing has changed in this legislation that prohibits that the department or the agency from releasing any of that information except under the very specific uh, times that are allowed in this, in this bill. So that's the same. The only thing we have done, and I'll defer over to Legislative Council to confirm what I'm saying is correct, that it, it removes the word agency and replaces it with department, but they're still under the same requirements and restrictions of how they can use uh, the information. That has not been changed. Okay. There's no, you know, I wouldn't think so, but it sometimes it's good to ask the question. There's just by virtue of the transition from one to the other doesn't all of a sudden open up the floodgates of, you know, and having that information leak. No, and of course the Department of Public Health handles very sensitive information also. So um, their, their information they, that they have is, is not typically released to the public in many cases. But here it would be a violation of Georgia law for them to release that information. Okay. Ms. Price. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ms. Silcox. Yes, I just wanted to um, say thank you to Chairman Cooper and Chairman Tanner for um, accepting my input on this bill. Um, I think the amendments are really good. I think the, the bill looks like a great compromise. I know that y'all worked very hard to um, bring a lot of parties together, so I appreciate your hard work. Um, I will just bring everyone's attention to the fact that um, I think a lot of this will be shut down um, in terms of um, abuse of opioids by shutting down um, the the misuse of prescriptions at pain clinics in Georgia. I think those are probably the largest offenders. You may or may not have seen the story um, in Northwest Atlanta this week where um, an anesthesiologist was convicted of distributing um, opioid prescriptions without a legitimate purpose on Hal Mill Road. So. Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. I mean, one of the reasons, and I want to say thank you that, you know, and that is our pain management bill that was carefully constructed and passed a few years ago has cracked down on the illegitimate pain centers. But, you know, and one of the things in crafting it and trying to be fair, doctors are not totally responsible for this problem. Americans don't think they should hurt for any reason now. And they go into the hospital and demand pain medication. I mean, the doctor may say, and a lot of the doctors, and the problem arises with our GPs, inter the first doctor that sees them, your internal medicine person, who sees people with the, the sore shoulder and says, you know, you really need to go to physical therapy. And the patient says, oh, my insurance won't cover it. Or, you know, doc, I work five days a week, and they're not open on Saturday. I want something for pain. I can't stand it anymore. And by making the incentive of saying, well, I, you know, I by law, and the doctors can use this, I can give you a three-day prescription, but you're going to have to find a way to go to an orthopedist, is an incentive to try to cut down. Now, they can give them more if they think they need it, but we're trying to incentivize them to use a lesser amount by not having to look it up in the PDMP. And hopefully, you know, they will do that. But it's a complex problem in our society. And, and anyway, and the other thing is, 
this bill covers all prescribers that would be doing Schedule Twos. If you're a dentist, if you're a uh, podiatrist, uh, you're covered by this. So uh, the vets are excluded, although we may have to come back someday and include the vets because we hear that there are some people actually, and this is a rare case so far, cutting their animals to go back in and get pain medicine in some states. So that's sort of California, this kind of thing now. <coughs> so uh, we tried to be very thorough with it. Members of the committee, I'm going to take a motion in just a second, but I see that there is an, uh, an amendment of AM 400196ER. There's no name on it, but I just want to make sure that if that is going to be presented by someone, that it lines up with the substitute that we're uh, it refers to the substitute 7463S. We're actually working off of 7491S. That doesn't mean that the amendment can't be lined up with the substitute. I just wanted to make the author aware of it if the author um, is going to offer that at the appropriate time, just as a fair warning. Ms. Price. Uh, thank you. This was, this was brought up in the, in the subcommittee. Can you Excuse me. This was brought up in the subcommittee, and uh, the wording, as I see it today, uh, and, and perhaps uh, Representative Spencer would like to speak to it, but I, I think the it line is up with line 341 now at the end of that paragraph on the sub um, 7491S. I know, but that's the well, sub. Well, <coughs> let me ask you to do this. I'm going to go ahead and take a motion. At the appropriate time, I'm going to recognize you for an amendment. I want you to just structurally let us know where the line, we can strike out the, the reference to the 7463S. That's fine. It just We can go ahead and obviously easily substitute it, but I'm going to need you to walk through the committee as to exactly where it would be in the bill. Yeah, at the end of line 341. After you do that, I'm then going to go ahead and ask the authors how they, um, their opinion on that, and then we'll, um, we'll just go to a vote on it. So what's the pleasure of the committee on, um, mm -mm. on House Bill 249? Ms. Silcox moves due pass of House Bill 249 by substitute LC 297491S. There is a second by the vice chair. Are there any amendments, Ms. Price? No, this, this is, yeah, this is not correct. Do you recognize if you want to offer you, if you want to offer? Uh, I'd like to offer an amendment uh, to be inserted. Uh, the the just the sentence that starts with a it. Okay. Inserted at the end of line. 341. All right, so strike in, strike the words individual's name, period. Right. Then the, your amendment would start, it shall be a defense of the prescriber that exigent circumstances caused a notation to not be documented in the patient's medical record. Do the authors have a copy of this amendment? Just, just now, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and do the authors have want to render an opinion on it? Well, a couple of things I think we need to keep in mind. First, um, under this legislation you have in front of us, the this is an administrative process that would be handled through uh, the board governing the doctor uh, that didn't make the notation. So they, they would have the ability to promulgate rules that they would go by and how to carry this out. Uh, the concern I have is, is that, again, trying to go back to what Chairman Setzler said, we're, we're trying to find a delicate balance here. And I think the reason we put that in there was to protect the doctors so that if they were accused of not checking it, uh, they would have, or if the database was down when they checked it, there would be a notation made. And again, we've also went so far as, and, and let me back up, we also did not hear any comments about this from the hospital association. They, they've supported this legislation the way it is. We also did not hear any negative comments on this issue from MAG uh, and the medical association simply because I think we have the delicate issue covered so that there's other people outside the doctor. So in a situation where you have someone working in an emergency room that's busy, every single prescriber working in that emergency room can have two delegates that's delegated to handle 
checking the database and entering that information for them. So again, is it going to be some additional requirements? Yes, but I think it is a delicate balance that we've met. So I would um, ask the committee not to adopt the amendment, and I would ask Chairman Cooper if she has any follow-up. Well, I know more about the PDMP system than I ever wanted to know about it now. And if there ever was a question, then the board could then ask for verification if the person checked because if a person checks that person's special number that they use to go into the PDMP is recorded that and it's put in there that they you know they went into the system so they would be able to tell whether they went into the system or not and whether you know who they were checking on so that part would be in the PDMP and could be verified with a yes or no just that it was checked. Ms. Price, do you want to address? Well, yeah, I think I did. I made an error in putting uh, it at, at the end of line 341. It really belongs in section three, just above it, in the in the section re referencing whether or not you made a note in the patient's record, and that's. All right. <laughs> you want to go ahead and re um, just for the it's, it's purposes the of clarity, exact, what line yeah, you're talking about? It's exactly about. the same sentence added at the end of line 332 because it's referencing whether or not you made a note in the record, not if you have civil uh, liability, you know, for having looked at or not looked at it. So specifically just saying, are you going to be held to account for not entering it in the record due to circumstances that were exigent? And if anybody's ever been in an ER and run two codes at the same time, writing something in somebody's record is not on the top of your list. I'm sorry, give me the location again. At the end of line 332, because it's talking about whether or not it makes it to the patient's record. Okay. So Ms. Price is offering. No, I, and I don't know if that's critical to the whole issue or not. I don't know. Well, that's why, that's why I was saying that if it was ever questioned, that there's a record of it in the PDMP. Right, but if they, they don't make note of it in the chart because the PDMP is down, that's the issue. That's right. Right. It, and one more thing, I just want to make sure that the committee's clear on, if if the doctor's in an emergency situation like that, you do not have to check in any way if you're administering the drugs at the hospital. The only time you're having to check it is if you're writing somebody out of script for over three days and sending them home. So in an emergency situation where you're running codes at the hospital and you're pushing drugs, there's no requirements to document anything in, in this. No, but th those things can happen contemporaneously. I, I, I yeah. just want to make sure the rest of the committee understands that. All right. So, Ms. Price, do you want to offer your amendment? Uh, if, if, if the authors feel it's appropriate, and I think Representative Spencer's plus minus, it was his idea, although I, I, I tend to agree. Well, I, I, what I think I heard is that the authors were, were hoping uh, to not have the amendment, but the lady has well, the right I, to bring the amendment. It was in the wrong place. That was the only thing. So now that it's in the right place, I don't know if that changes their mind. No, I, I, I'm not going to be overly concerned either way, Mr. Chairman. Okay. But I would, um, it, my preference would be that we not adopt the amendment. But again, I think it's important for the protection of the doctor that it be documented in the file if the system's down. But again, it'd be at the pleasure of the committee. All right. On Ms. Price's amendment, uh, on House Bill 249, LC 297491S at the end of line 332 after the period after the word n name, it shall be defense of the prescriber that exigent circumstances caused the notation to not be documented in the patient's medical record. All in favor of the ladies' motion. I, I have to go. We've got to keep going. All in favor of the ladies' amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Let's get a hand vote. All in favor of the amendment, please signify by raising your hand. Opposed? And the amendment is not adopted. Are there any further amendments? Any further amendments? Seeing none, all in favor of the underlying motion of dupe. I'm sorry. What was that happening? Oh, the, oh, the, uh, the cleanup on the PDMP, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, PDMP. All through the, all through the. <laughs> it, it refers it's, to it's it as PMDP, Mr. Chairman. It should be PDMP. Pardon? It's defined it's in the beginning, I believe. It means the prescription monitoring database. 
No, it is PMDP. <laughs> no. I guess the question is in, in the previous sections in the code, what is it referred to? I, I will defer to my smarter partner, uh, Chairman Cooper. Well, we call it the PDMP. And is there an acronym in another place in the code that is PDM? P. P. M. D. B. You made it up. I made it all up. Okay. I just didn't know what it was called. Okay. <laughs> Do we need an amendment for that, or is, if it's otherwise, if it's, is it otherwise consistent with the other sections? So moved. Any objection? Prescription drug monitoring program, a voice from beyond. <laughs> we'll take all the help we can get. <laughs> Is that clear to members of the committee? I'll move on that as our objection. Ms. Price? Difference if you're talking about the program versus the database. This is what we're going to do. We're going to hold off synonymous. on that issue. We're going to look at it. We're going to make sure we're right. We'll pop it on the floor as a technical amendment if necessary. Any objection to that? No. Seeing none, all in favor of the underlying motion of do pass by substitute at HB 249 7491S as in Sam. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you both. Thank you. Let's move directly. I think we're going to lose some people in a little while, but let's move uh, directly to 258. Uh, Mr. Powell's not here. Mr. Reeves is going to handle it for him. Mr. Reeves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're on House Bill um, 258, LC 297483S. Everybody, please check and make sure that you think that this was um, working off substitute LC 297483S as in Sam for House Bill 258. Okay. Members of the committee, I am presenting this bill for uh, Chairman Alan Powell, who is chairing his own committee right now. Um, Mr. Porter is here to aid and assist with questions. Uh, this is actually a, a relatively simple concept. Um, it, it's in the aggravated section one involves the aggravated assault section of title 16 and uh, section d of 16-5-21 which is aggravated assault is the specific type of aggravated assault dealing with um, an aggravated assault being committed against a peace officer and what this bill does is that it changes the sentencing provisions if an aggravated assault is committed against a police officer, the punishment range, instead of being five to 20, would move from 10 to 20. And then additionally beyond that, if the um, aggravated assault involved the discharge of a firearm, and you can see in line 20 that firearm is defined as a, essentially a real gun as opposed to a replica gun, if the aggravated assault is um, resulting from the discharge of a firearm by a person who is at least 17 years of age, then, the, then that 10 year sentence would be a mandatory minimum, 10 years to serve. It would be eligible for parole, but the, um, it would be a 10 year mandatory minimum sentence. Um, I note that th the part of this that says um, the person has to be at least 17 years of age, this in effect, carves out the bill that the House passed this morning that I presented um, relating to juveniles who are moved to Superior Court for these type of charges. So they would not be subject to this sentencing. Um, that would just be the regular range of sentencing. So they would not be subject to mandatory minimum. Um, but that is the concept in Section 1. It's a pretty simple, straightforward policy. And then in section two um, is moves us to the felony obstruction code section, which is 1610 24. 
And this essentially says um, that upon a first conviction, the range of sentencing is one, one year to five years, which is how the law is right now. Upon a second conviction of felony obstruction, the range would be from two years to ten years. And upon a third or subsequent conviction of felony obstruction, the range would be from three years to 15 years. This, the, this provision, the stepping up in sentencing range, there is no, this is not a mandatory minimum. This is just a, a, a step up in the minimum threshold sentence and also adding to the maximum range, but there's no mandatory minimum language there. And so uh, that is the bill. I don't know if Mr. Porter um, had any thoughts to add. Let me ask any questions for what I'll call the co-author since the <laughs> primary author is not here. Any questions for Mr. Reeves? Seeing none, Mr. Porter, you want to say something? Your Honor, or Mr. Chairman, I've we're the district attorneys are in support of this bill. We think it's more important to, pr to protect by the legislature police officers. It not only protects our police officers, but it also, particularly in the, in the case of of obstruction of a police officer, my instructions to the officers are in, in Gwinnett is take the charge rather than rather than try and get some street justice. And and we've seen an effect or a culture where we have fewer force complaints. We have a lot of obstruction complaints, but we have fewer use of force complaints. So I think it has a <coughs> unintended effect that if these officers are given a a alternative to physical force, they'll use the charge rather than the, like I say, street justice. Ms. Price, did you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. I, I, I asked this in, in the subcommittee. I'm not sure I totally grasped the difference, and maybe someone can explain to me later, but is discharge of a firearm identical to expelling a projectile? Um, a discharge of a firearm, a discharge is a verb, which would be the intentional use of the firearm causing the expelling of the projectile, would be how I would read that. Okay, so an unloaded fire, is such can't thing be, as an unloaded can't be firearm? Discharged. Cannot be discharged. Right. Okay. And, and the electronic portion, uh, Mr. Reeves asked about that. There are some firearms that are ignited by electricity rather than by by percussion and the percussion count. Is there anyone who, I see no further questions, is there anyone here who would like to be recognized in opposition to House Bill 258? There's a question. Mr. Bode, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Porter, I, I'm just looking at the bill and, and I definitely understand and, and realize the, the concern uh, with the safety of our police officers. However, um, uh, the 10 year mandatory minimum, do we, do we have a, a reason for that number? Um, I, I know that we're kind of moving away from criminal justice reform, um, especially in light of my House Bill 67 in, in its original form. Yes, so um, I, I think that's it's a lot of time and I definitely understand the, the, the need for it. Uh, but do you know if the sponsor of the bill would even consider maybe five years mandatory minimum instead of the, the full ten? Or I, I can't. Speak you can't to speak that. to that. I think, I think I think Chairman Powell was insistent on this as a total package of support for law enforcement and protection of law enforcement. I think there's as much a deterrent statement as a as a uh, as anything else in this. Uh, I would suspect from our discussions with him that because we had multiple discussions with him to coordinate this with Chairman Reeves' bill regarding minors. We had a number of discussions. I would suspect that he would not be amenable to that. Because I see where in the, the new substitute that the original bill did have uh, punishment levels for obstruction, felony obstruction, and it did take out the mandatory language for uh, offense two and three or any subsequent offenses. Um, that 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 ten year mandatory minimum it, it does concern me. I, I I can only say that would be a policy decision for the for the committee. Mr. Bodie, let me 
address something that you said, and maybe it may answer your question between yes, the lines. We, you know, you had made the statement. I don't know if I assume it was not a misstatement that we're getting away from criminal justice reform. On the contrary, we're still in the heart of our effort on criminal justice reform. But the heart of the criminal justice reform debate in this committee has been pivotal to the success of criminal justice reform over the last six years. Of course, the entire effort is, was spurred. Uh, by uh, Governor Deal and, and credit where credit is due. But the heart of criminal justice reform goes to nonviolent offenders. Okay. And in the first couple of years, and the gentleman obviously wasn't here at the time, so, but the first couple of years especially, we concentrated, not exclusively, but for the most part on really the nonviolent drug offender. And I think we've, we've taken a look at areas and are continuing to take a look at areas where you have nonviolent, non-drug offenders. Those are certainly up for debate as well. But this obviously is in a different realm. And our, our one of our, the bulwark of that conversation, of that debate, is that we're, we're taking a different view of these nonviolent offenders so that we can go ahead and reserve our prison beds for truly violent offenders. And I would never deign to speak for Representative Alan Powell, who really could if you think about it. <laughs> but but I, I'm going to go ahead and make a lot, make a leap by saying that this is exactly who we're talking about on the other end okay. of criminal justice reform. So I, that, I don't say that to persuade or dissuade. It's really more of an informational background or just so that we're kind of clear on, on what the, the big picture goals have been for just for the gentleman's information. Nothing more, nothing less. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Setzler, you have something? I want to go to a motion. We're going to lose people in a few minutes. Um, Mr. Porter, question for you. Um, you know, as we try to line, line things up and make them congruent or, or, or equate them to other things in law, what other, could you remind the committee, what other um, things in law would, if convicted, lead to the same kind of, t uh, not less than 10 years, can't be probated? I mean, it's, it gets back to sort of the SB 440 things and, and if there's others. I mean. This, this brings it up. This would bring discharging a firearm at a, at a police officer up to armed robbery and other. Armed arm robbery, rape, certain sexual offenses, and certain drug, certain trafficking weight drug offenses. Right. And again, the armed robbery statute, as it's currently drawn, would allow somebody to even communicate the presence of a gun without brandishing a gun or Correct. discharging a gun at somebody. So what we're doing is, in essence, saying. Or the use of a replica. Or, or the use of a replica. Armed robbery. So if that's a 10-year shall not be probated offense, this is discharging a, a, a round at a police officer. Is that in the weight of things consistent with what we've done? It's not a big stretch for me, Mr. Chairman, to, to get there with this. I just wanted people to understand that there's a, there's a series of offenses that exist like this, and now we're adding to that list discharging a firearm at a police officer. I think Mr. Reeves said it best. It's a straight policy call. It really is. It's just a question of where we're going on that particular issue. You're uh, not going to get any now, disagreement from the district now, attorney. Now and in the that. future. So with that, let me ask again, is there anyone here who need, wants to be recognized in opposition to House Bill 258? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the committee? Second. Mr. Strickland moves due pass of House Bill 258, LC297483S. There's a second by Mr. Gravely. Are there any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signif signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. I think we were very efficient in this meeting. Um, I said at the beginning of the meeting for people who were not here at the beginning, House Bill 32, we're holding on that. Um, the authors and interested members of the subcommittee are working on a potential substitute. It is possible that we may have a special call meeting on that, maybe in the speaker's conference room after the morning prayer tomorrow. tomorrow. Maybe. Uh, we'll, I think we do need to go ahead and, and consider that bill. Um, we're trying to streak, uh, strike a consensus on a very, very difficult issue. Mr. Reeves said the words threading the needle. I can't think of a better example of that than House Bill 32. Uh, but we will, the, uh, the chair's intent is to have a special call meeting as soon as practical uh, tomorrow. Just look out for an announcement and just check your email, send it electronically as well, um, as soon as we can. Thank you for your time and for your consideration this afternoon. We're adjourned. <laughs>